Maven Koo invited me to join his company in its founding year and it happened to be sort of at a time when I would have completed my third year which means I got my Bachelor of Medical Sciences degree and it just fell at a better time so I took a sabbatical from the university thinking that I'd go back after a year and then after a year I took a second sabbatical because I wanted to do the following year's touring and by then I sort of just knew I didn't want to go back. So when I started with Maven I just worked with him um, and then at the end of the second year of touring I started to apply for my first Arts Council grant and I you know I was able to sort of create projects um, for that were funded. I was still asking people to choreograph on me at that point. I wasn't ready to make work on myself or anyone else to be honest. And then during that time I decided why not try something so then I chose to ask Kamala if she wanted to work with me and we made our first piece together and then you know that sort of continued as a collaborative partnership for a few more years and then I started yeah doing more stuff on my own but also working with other companies either as a dancer, a divisor, a choreographer and then on the other, on the other side of that making my own work with my own dancers so just filling my cup from all directions. The experiences that I have as, as a brown woman basically, as a, as a woman of colour um, in this country and the w things that are expected of me when I, you know, when I'm encountered where, and you know with one of the films, uh, one film that uh, I made with uh, Kamala and Maria Ackerson, um, The Art of Defining Me, that was based on the fact that I had an interview with someone f to be a sort of outsourced dance teacher, you know, just for workshops. And the teacher complained that I didn't pretend I was from India because evidently to them it wasn't good enough that I was a diasporic Indian person who practiced and worked very hard as an Indian classical dancer. That didn't seem to be authentic enough. And so that was a you know really stressful experience being fired from something because I, I didn't pretend to be something else for their to appease their you know idea of what Indian means and um, but I also think internally we are very much in the South Asian sector I think we have to be really careful not to pander to the white gaze and not to not to appease that just in order to succeed and I think one of the things that I found was a lot of sort of language around South Indian, South Asian classical dance forms, especially Bharatanatyam, uh, constantly being described as ancient and temple and one of the oldest dance forms and all of those things and this, this is very much language that was used by, you know, in the process of nationalism and it, actually the dance form of Bharatanatyam was disenfranchised by partition and nationalism and all of those things and sanitized and become very, it became very different and, you know, disenfranchised m many people and we choose in this sort of sector of South Asian dance to often propagate that myth and whitewash the history of our own dance forms because it makes it more exotic and it makes it more sellable. And so this idea that, you know, we ourselves are whitewashing things just sort of made me look deeper at what else was whitewashed and evidently, you know, our histories are so whitewashed because they're written by the victors. And it just opened up this sort of avenue of exploration even more. It was almost about creating a um, a lie in itself, a whitewash story in itself to see how people would respond to someone that looked and sounded like me. To tell a whitewash story with all this exotic sumptuous language and then see before their eyes that I'm actually a despotic crazy person by the end of it that epitomizes you know colonialism and and death and destruction and um, it was more to create a seduction really because people want to just believe the nice thing I think they want to believe that whatever I say will be you know authentic and true and all of those things and so I thought well why not use that as a tool to subvert oh it was really well received I mean I, I mean relatively speaking I don't know how other things are received I think 
dance, contemporary dance in Australia is very athletic. There's a lot of you know acrobatic tumblingness. It's it's very different to I think European, British, contemporary dance, which has a maybe slightly different sort of range. It's not that we don't have those things, but it's not the biggest focus and it's not sort of validated based on that. So I think that was something very different for that dance scene. Um, and it, it lent itself more to the theatre audience, I think. So we were at the Adelaide Fringe um, at a theatre venue, predominantly Holden Street Theatres. Um, and we won the Peace Foundation Award. We won Best Dance at the Adelaide Fringe. Um, and when we took it on tour, I, I, a lot of the places we went to when we toured were what you'd consider rural there. So, I mean, you say rural, but they had 900 seat theatres. It's not like they didn't weren't equipped. Um, but it was predominantly white audiences in those places. It's only when we went to more, more of the metropolitan cities like Melbourne and, and Adelaide uh, and um, those sorts of places where we got a slightly different audience and, and during the fringe where you know, a couple of indigenous Australian people would come up to me and just, you know, and even in the UK, people of colour have come up to me to say that this puts into, like, like it, it puts into shape something I didn't have the words to describe. They, like, you see the violence from the start in the piece, even though it's done in this sort of seductive way, there is a violence right from the start in the characterization. And I feel that those people who have a stake in that history are the ones who feel that the most. When I did this work, the Not, Not Today's Yesterday work, it was spanning over so many years, developing, being performed quite a lot, and I still love doing it. I hope there's more life in it yet. But you know, you come to a point where I'm ready to make something new now. And because something was such a big part of you and so inspiring to do, it's almost difficult to think, well, how can the next thing measure up to that? And so I'd be, you know, thinking about things. And then I had a, another idea, which I started to explore. It wasn't the film, it was a bigger project. Um, but one of the scenes in that project was about the British Museum and how we look at brown, white and black bodies and what, how we describe them, how we talk about them. And, um, and then I was offered something from Chats Palace as the opportunity to create a short film. And I wanted to, get, it was a, such a tiny resource. Normally I would say no, but in the middle of COVID when you haven't made anything for the best part of a year, I thought, well, why not let me just do something, keep it really si simple. Um, and yeah, it, it manifested as a very British museum. Um, and I think I am um, preoccupied with these subject matters, so they do link to each other, but I think they're also shifting and growing and dynamic. And so it's not always just one thing leads to the next, I think. Yeah. Oh gosh, um, again, it started off very uh, experimentally in as much as I'm not a fan of group Bharatanatyam, never have been. And I wondered why that was. So I thought, well, why don't I try my hand at it and see what I would like to see and make. And the logical next step was to think, well, you know, Bharatanatyam as a solo dance form, why don't I try and learn from things that are inherently ensemble or have been interpreted in an ensemble um, manner and that lent itself to something like the Rite of Spring which is often made with giant casts and and I, uh, Swan Lake was another one, Bolero. And so I, it's not that I used the existing choreographies as inspiration, I just wanted to be informed about what had been done and then I sort of just went my own track with it um, and the experiment just highlighted how well Stravinsky's score went with the rhythmic aspect of Bharatanatyam. We only explored the first eight minutes and with that excerpt I generated a lot of interest for me to create the full work. I didn't go and identically translate the score bar by bar, as in I did go through all the bars but I didn't make it into bars I did it into phrases so sometimes my bars were like 14 beats long or random numbers but it meant that I could create these patterns of where I could feel the phrasing and that sort of stuff and um, so that was one layer with the music and then the second layer was with how the narrative progresses in the piece 
and I was petrified to deal with the narrative, especially in the second half where the music gets quite kind of obscure and much less rhythmic. So it really is about doing something else with Bharatanatyam that isn't isn't the footwork and the rhythms and, and that kind of thing. But I kept to sort of the titles of each section of the music, which Stravinsky had entitled for the ballet. And I used this, the words in those titles as sort of inspiration to create the imagery that I was. And so in the first half, it's just more joyous. I almost feel it's like a game that nobody quite knows what the game is, but they're chasing and playing and that it's much more light and youthful. And then as the piece sort of transitions from the first to the second half, it starts to get much darker and the gravity of what the story is sort of comes to play there and from there we follow that journey. In a lot of the original way the story is done is that the community of people choose someone, the chosen one, who is often a young female virgin to sacrifice to the earth so that spring can be born the next time. Whereas I did it in a way where the chosen one sort of is identified through the natural play and then anointed almost by the community to be raised and deified and then the community sacrifices themselves to the chosen one not the chosen one so there's a more of a cyclical nature that everyone sacrifices themselves but in a way that it's a reverse birth so that a new birth can happen and it's quite epic really like you haven't i haven't seen in my time someone doing fully a bharatanatyam work with a big orchestra like this in the pit of a main stage venue like this. You know, you might get Akram to do that with the NB or something, but it's not really something that I've seen someone that I feel comparable to doing, you know. So I take that opportunity very seriously. Um, but I also think it's deserved for our field yeah. to see that. Yeah. I work very hard to make sure the dancers um, are in a good, strong Bharatanatyam position, that they're not sort of, you know, not good with Bharatanatyam. All, all our classes, every single day of rehearsals includes full Bharatanatyam adavas. You know, very strict about those sorts of things because I think we can't rest on our laurels when we're up on such big stages. Even if people have never seen that form before, we have to present it the best that we can. I think that there absolutely has been movement in, in, the, in the visibility and popularization of something like Bharatanatyam and Kathak. It's been through different channels, you know, you've got the Akrams and the Shobhanas who have propelled it on some level, even though not all their work necessarily is, is identifiable as that because they're not making classical work. Um, and then you've got things like BBC Young Dancer, where you, you know, you've seen some young dancers coming up through that, where their dance form has never been really experienced on a mass scale like that, and, and now, now it is. Um, and then at grassroots levels, you've had the development of CAP programs and ISTD and things like that, which give people more tangible sort of outcomes. I mean, it's debatable how, how good those things are because I still don't necessarily see a translation into the professional sector. I think there's still a bit of a gap with, with that and trying to encourage and support dancers to take, it, take dance as a full-time profession. Culturally speaking, it has, its, it has its barriers as well within family situations and things. I don't really identify I think with my politics, with a lot of people within the South Asian sector, I feel a little different with some of them. And, and I don't come from money or privilege or wealth or connections, which I think a lot of people within the South Asian sector who run these establishments do on many levels. And I think that's where there's a bit of a discrepancy with a new batch of people coming in who are much more politically engaged, much more savvy with the internet and social media and things like this. I sort of sit between the two of those places where, um, you know, I, I always felt like an outsider and not supported by within the South Asian community because I would stand up for better working rights. I would stand up for better working pay. I would expect to be, you know, to be dealt with and handled professionally speaking. I, I think that 
watering things down just to appease certain tastes and things is not my cup of tea. I think we need to elevate elevate people. We can bring them with us in a way where we don't have to compromise ourselves. And I sometimes think that, you know, I think there have been many things going on over the last 30, 40 years where that hasn't been the case. And I, I'm just happy to stick to where I am and find my tribe elsewhere. And I don't look in one pool of people for that. I look wherever it, and I seek and I wait for wherever it will come from, because those people do find each other, we find each other, the people with the same interests politically, with the same motivations around activism, with the same motivations around quality and representation, diversity and equal equality. I think these things are very much buzzwords, but actually I feel like I live and breathe what that actually means to do. And I've done it at a, a sacrifice to myself and my success. But my, st my growth has been steady, not kind of stratospheric in a very fast way. And I think it's because of my, my um, my stubbornness to hold on to those things and want to have the integrity so that I can, you know, look at myself and haven't become lost in the, in the desire for success, in the desire to be liked, in the desire to be all of, you know, all the things that I think it's very easy to get sucked into when you're a performing artist of any sort. And so I don't feel necessarily supported within the sector all the time, but I do it knowingly that I'm also maintaining my integrity with what I think I need to do and believe is a good path. <laughs>